Good morning um, and welcome again to this time where we look at the Word of God together and um, see what the Lord has to do and say to us today. I want to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3 from verse 7 I will be reading so if you have your Bibles please feel free to turn with me to that passage which I will be talking to you. But before we do that allow me to just quickly Say a prayer, and then, um, and then uh, we will proceed indeed. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that you have given us um, the gift of life, that we could wake up this morning and um, still have the ability to rejoice in you, Lord, that you are with us, that we are still strong and able to press on with what today has for us. Lord, now I, I come and I bless your time as we, this time as we come to your word, I bless your word. I thank you that you have given us the tools, you have given us the ability to read scripture. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, oh God, you have given us that revelation, that light to illuminate scripture to us, to give us the ability to understand your word, Lord, for our life, Lord, for our future, Lord. So I just pray that you help us, give us ears, give us eyes to see and hear. And Lord, give us a heart that can receive your message today. In the mighty name of Jesus, we bless this time. And Holy Spirit, I welcome you. I welcome you in our hearts as we listen to your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. As you remember last week, we did speak about shame and uh, we also said that shame could turn to be like a spiritual depression where it discourages us to be with the Lord to walk in our life with God the things that God has set for us and if not check that that shame could turn into bitterness and, and, and harden our hearts where we would not be wanting to accept the love of God. We would not be wanting to uh, press forward by more like isolate ourselves, not happy with who we are, not happy with what's happening to us and so on and so forth and just um, decapitate us in a sense and not allow us to fulfill the future and the goals that the Lord has for us. The scripture says that God has great plans, hallelujah, for all of us. He has plans to prosper us and not to harm us, and so on and so forth. Today I thought um, it would be good if we focus um, sort of following from there um, to what Paul is trying to teach us, really. And here we see, in my understanding, the importance of following Christ, the importance of committing and continuing to recommit our life, not giving up in a sense, um, to walk with Jesus. And also see what happens to our life as we walk with the Lord. Um, so before I, I talk more, let's just read the passage and try to bring some context to, to the words today. So chapter 3 of uh, 2 Corinthians, um, and from verse 7, here I go. Now the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters of stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory. Uh, transitory though it was, will not be the ministry of the Spirit be more glorious? If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? Hallelujah. For what was glorious has now has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory that which lost. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses who would 
put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelite from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the Old Covenant is read. It has not been removed because only Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Hallelujah. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory which comes from the lord who is the spirit praise the lord that is a powerful powerful passage in my opinion anyways and um also there's quite a lot in there and sometimes i think we need to read it carefully to try and understand the extent of what paul is trying to teach us here but um, let me just uh, try to bring some context to these passages. Um, if, if we were to go in, the, in chapter 2, we will be able to understand a little bit more of the context of what was happening in this passage. Here, um, Paul is speaking, or he has been preaching to the Gentiles in Corinth. And um, Yet some of us may be confused as to why is he talking about the law? Why is he talking about Moses, um, where Gentiles were not as much affected as um, the Jewish people or Hebrews would be in, in that aspect. But the thing that was happening, friends, here, so we would understand, is that Paul is trying to um, wind away, we try to cast out all doubts and all false teaching that some of the false apostles that he calls them is trying to bring some false teaching. And, and to me, as I read this, it kind of gives me that understanding that there is some um, identity crisis here where people are trying, are, are struggling to find their true identity, to try and find um, truly where they belong or what, what are they supposed to do. It's, 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 there's a confusion there. Whereas these people, um, false apostles, if you like, false teachers, they, they'd come to the church and they they'd brought this teaching where, um, yes, Jesus, yes, what Paul is saying, but, you know, that's not enough. What they're trying to do is they're trying to bring Jesus plus works, if you like. So they're saying, yes, we believe in Jesus, but also we have to believe in the Ten Commandments. We also have to believe in law. We also have to conform to Judaism, if you like. We have to, we have to do the things that, you know, the Old Testament has continually taught us. And, they, and this is where Paul is trying to come in now and say to them that, um, I mean, in verse 14, he says that their mind were made dull. And he brings in Moses. And if you remember the story of Moses, I a mean, glorious story there. Uh, Moses, he had spent um, a lot of time, 40 days in the mountain, in the presence of God. And that's where he... He was so close, Scripture says, to the presence of God that as he came down the mountain, his face was shining bright because of God's presence, because of how much he had taken from the presence of the Lord. And therefore, he had to cover, he had to cover his face um, when he saw other people because of his brightness. But Paul here is bringing a different angle, if you like. He's saying that um, Moses covered his face so the Jewish people, because God made their minds dull, they could not see the extent of God's glory. So they had, he had to put their, their, their cover in, the, in his face to, to cover that. And then he goes on to um, making his argument that 
even when they read the Old Testament, that veil which hindered them to see the brightness, that glorious shine of God's presence, is still covering their hearts when they read the Old Testament. It's still preventing them to see the truth of who Jesus Christ is. He's basically um, comparing the Old Covenant, which was in the Old Testament, that required works and deeds in order to be justified, if you like, in order to be accepted in the presence of God, all of those sacrifices with a glory, as he puts it, that remains forever with a glory that those who come to the Lord, their veil will be torn apart, will be disappeared. And only that can happen when we come to Jesus Christ. And this is what he's trying to teach the church. And he's trying to cast out any doubts whatsoever. And, and he's trying to to expose this false teaching that when you have accepted Christ, the old covenant, the law does not have claws on you because you and I are saved by grace, hallelujah, and grace is more than sufficient for us. What a beautiful message that is. And then I love the last verse that he speaks in verse 18. I'm going to read that again. And this should be hopefully ringing in our ears as we continue with the sermon and we finish um, as well. Um, and here's what verse 18 says. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate. So he's bringing right at the start there. He said, for all of those people now who believe in Jesus don't have the veil that Moses had to put to hide away the presence of the Lord. We who are in Christ, the veil, any hindrance, anything that can stop the glory of the Lord is unveiled, is gone. Our faces are exposed, if you like. All of us who with unveiled faces, everyone who calls on the name of Jesus, who calls and understand the Lord to be their Lord and Savior, with their unveiled faces, contemplate the Lord's glory. We are able to think, we are able to absorb, to take in the glory, the tremendous glory of God. God's given us that ability. I just lost my place here, sorry. Um, contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into His image with the ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. And Paul just adds to, to that um, great message, if you like, that our Christian life is not only about being, our eyes being open. It's not only about our faith being awakened and understand and accept the truth of the Lord. It's not only about enjoying the presence of the Lord, but also is a process is a process lifelong, friends. And every time, every day that we live in this life, every, every difficulty, every trial, every hardship that we pass, as long as we commit in the Lord, as long as we do not give up, as long as we push forward in the name of Jesus, what is happening through the Spirit of the Lord that is in our life, Paul says, that our life is changing, is changing from glory to glory, not from worse to better, but from glory, from a beautiful place to even more glorious, and on and on into completing the process where we would be all in the image of God as we had originally intended to be. Hallelujah. What a beautiful, beautiful message in my understanding that is. And great hope when we look, when we look in the Word of God and the teaching that Paul, Paul
Paul uh, teaches us. But now, I want us to just come back to reality, if you like. Let's, let's turn a little bit to our daily life, to our life that we live in our current world. You see, we all suffer, if you like, with identity crisis. We all suffer, in a sense, from time to time of trying to figure out who we really are. What is our goal? What are we doing here? Okay? Um, and in today's world, many people, uh, if you like, are spending a great deal of time trying to figure out just how or who they are. And then often, um, when they discover who they are, um, they find it hard dealing with that reality or what they find. But if we look into Scripture, in um, Jeremiah 17, 9, it says that the human heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Which is sad, isn't it? But, you know, it's true. The Bible also tells us that it is the Holy Spirit who begins a new transforming work within a person at the moment of commitment to follow Jesus and become um, the term that we find, um, I don't know, I'm sure you've heard before, born again. We can find that in chapter 3 of the Gospel of John, um, beginning of Gospel of John. Born again. And that is the application of the work that becomes the real change is when we accept Jesus into our hearts, the Holy Spirit coming upon us and beginning that work, giving us a new identity. Paul, again, he puts it beautifully in, in um, a different passage. He says, when we accept Christ, we are a new creation. A new identity is birthed within us. And that is the term when we, we are born again, we have the first birth through Adam, if you like, our, our human nature, our fallen nature. But when we come to Christ, through the help of the Holy Spirit, we have another birth, if you like, a, a beginning of a new identity which identifies with Christ and Him alone. And there, where the Holy Spirit now dwells in us, um, I don't know if you've um, been able to look at a couple of sermons before, of us being the temple of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit working in us to that new identity, if you like. And another sad aspect of um, Christian life, if you like, that we find is for many Christians, um, they will find, and I have talked to one, one or two, and you know, it's yeah, to me, it's a little bit sad, but anyways, uh, many Christians are content to just get forgiven, get to that point where they accept Jesus, their sins are forgiven, and they know they're going to heaven when they die. And for them, you know, you see, this is all great, this is all true, and it's great, but except for the fact that because they are going to heaven, they often think that they can ignore and avoid dealing with life's many problems in the here and now. It's all good understanding the hope that is waiting for us, friends. And Scripture says that the hope that we have in the Lord is unshakable. Hallelujah. You know, we, no matter what happens to our life, when we believe in Jesus, we are secured with Jesus in eternity. But that does not avoid the fact, just because we're going to heaven, that um, we can ignore and avoid dealing with the life's many problems in the here and now. Often when these people find themselves challenged by life's stresses and pressures, they think that they can emotionally and psychologically, if you like, avoid dealing with those problems by just hoping for the day of the Lord's appearing when they are taken to the Lord 
and taken out of the nightmare that they are feeling in their life. And this, in a sense, mask, uh, makes it really easy to avoid having to confront with the present reality. And a lot of people, we have, we have a saying where um, it's a lot easier for us to stick our, our head under the sand and pretend nothing is happening. Um, I, allow me to just ask a question here um, to, to you today. In, look in your life and tell me what are the things perhaps that you do in your life um, that would define who you really are? What do you think are the things that you do or things that you love, if you like, that you would say defines your identity, defines who you really are? I ask that question because some people acquire their identity, if you like, through the task that they do or the object they identify themselves with. Or others may find their identity in what they wear, what they own, how they look where they live, or what kind of car they drive. If we were to separate men and women, and I am not stereotyping, please don't misunderstand me, I'm just finding a general point here. Um, men often uh, may find their identity in the job that they do. That will make them proud over the achievement that they do, the work that they do. And women often find um, find theirs through personal and family relationships. Ultimately, when we come as Christians, as born-again Christians, Scripture simply tells us that no matter if you are a man or if you are a woman, we must identify ourselves with Jesus alone. And that's the difference. Um, we are brought up in, 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 in an old nature and we can't just take away and cast that away. It's part of us for the time that we live. But when we accept Jesus, the Bible says that we, we are a new creation. And with that understanding, we must love to be with Christ and we must identify our new identity must be found in Jesus and Jesus alone and what he has done for us that is very important it's not what um, we have done to him because for him sorry because salvation is about what he has what he has already done not uh, what we could ever do Hallelujah. Scripture often tells us that the Holy Spirit is at work in us. And that's, I might understand what Paul is trying to say here in, in the passage that I read to you. Um, the way that we are transforming from glory to glory is by the Holy Spirit having that um, supernatural surgery if you like to remove the old nature to the, the conflict uh, between it and the new nature that is found in Jesus identifies as the as transforms the newborn again Christians as it transform more into the image and the likeness of Jesus Paul actually speaks of this and it gives us a very good picture of he compares this to what actually is happening to him. If you have your Bibles, either just drop this passage down or uh, write it somewhere. Paul speaks of this in Romans chapter 7 verse 15. It says, For I do not understand my own action." For I do, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law. That is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. 
for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it on. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me or within me. Paul continues, and in a sense, he goes on to express his dilemma. He said, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? He identifies his weakness, he identifies his, his uh, shortfalls, which we all do often, and, and then no one is exempt from this, friends. We all know what is right. We all know what is good. And from time to time, we end up doing what is the opposite. And Paul expresses his dilemma. Wretched me, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And hallelujah. Then in, in verse 25, towards the end, he he proclaims the answer. He says, Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh serve the law of sin. Hallelujah. Paul comes to that understanding. Paul gives us a very good insight to um, the life of a human being, if you like. He identifies with himself. He shows us the weakness of our fallen nature. He shows us that we are not exempt from ever committing a sin, for ever doing um, things um, wrong. Not that he is condoling them, not that he is saying just because we can't uh, stop ourselves 100% that it is okay to do wrong. That's not at all. But he's saying that we have that weakness in us. We, we have this old nature which we carry with us. We will be carrying it till the day that we see the glory, till the day that we see Jesus face to face. But then he comes to the end with his glorious revelation that he says, but praise to God, God has opened my mind. God has given me the ability to understand that I can serve the law of God in my understanding. I can allow God to be in my life. I can identify with God. Lord, I am yours. Lord, I will continue to serve with you. And I think it connects with what he's trying to say here, that our life, friends, is a process. It cannot be a Christian just one day a week going to church. Well, we can't go to church, but you know, a Sunday meeting in Zoom, if you like, or listening to this preaching. But it is a process. And the more we follow, the more we are committed with Christ and closer we come to God, the more all that new identity is revealed in us and the less of that old nature has the power in our life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And it's so important for us to be committed and not give up. Continue with the Lord indeed. Praise the Lord. I want to, um, I probably am crazy to even think about this, but I want to express, to illustrate this um, with you to what I think Paul is trying to say. Um, so I have here an illustration, and Lord help me, I don't make a horrible mess over my Bible and my laptop, which I'll be in big trouble. Um, but here, let me explain to you the madness that I have and trying to explain what I mean. I have here a cup of, well, a, a cup with rice in it, and um, the cup, friends, represents you and me. The cup represents our capacity. Scripture says that we are a vessel. And therefore, I feel that we all have a same capacity to hold on to um, intense uh, content put into the cup. 
and I put rice there. Um, rice, let's say, represents our old nature. But you see, um, as I said in the beginning, the beauty of us coming to Jesus Christ is that we accept Jesus as a Lord and Savior into our life. And then God brings His Holy Spirit and power into our life. God brings His anointing into our life. But you see, we only have a certain capacity that we can hold in our life, okay? So here's the Holy Spirit, and here's the cup that the Lord is pouring in us. And I have not made a lot of mess yet. Here we go, here we go, here we go. But you see, this is how much I can put in there. This is how much it holds. If I put any more there, it doesn't matter how much God pours over. The rest of it is gone. It, we cannot hold anymore. The cup is half full. Okay? And to my understanding, this is because that's our old nature and that's how much God has given us. That's how much of God we have in us. The new identity that Christ has given us. But you see, the Holy Spirit is doing, God has started a work in us, Scripture says. And He will not finish until He has perfected His handiwork, your life and my life. But the more that we come closer to God, the less of me and the more of the Lord. Amen. So the less of the claws, the less of our human nature, our sin has grabbed in us and the more of God into our life. You see, God is changing, as Paul says, changing us from glory to glory. But do not be mistaken, God is, Paul is not saying that God is changing our old nature. In fact, God is killing our old nature. He's, he is trying to disappear that little by little. So the more of God is grown in us. Amen. That new creation that, that we are in Christ, that we can identify with Christ, the more of that is growing in us. And when we are committed to God, when we face all the trials, when we face all the difficulties, we are being, Scripture says, we are being refined Praise the Lord. We are being refined through all of our difficulties and we are not giving up. The pandemic that has upon us, the difficulties that are upon us, we are not giving up. We will continue to whatever capacity we are able to. But we are saying, Lord, we do not give up on you. Amen. And the closer that we go to God, the lesser of me and the more space for the Lord to be in our life. And here we go, the Holy Spirit again in our life. That we are more committed to Him. And look, friends, there's a lot more of God there. There is more power, hallelujah. There is more power of the Holy Spirit in our life. There is more passion. There is more desire. There is more will in our life to commit to the Lord, to go closer to the Lord. The desire to pray our hearts out to the Lord. The desire to intercede for others to the Lord. The desire to, to minister to others to the Lord. Because there is more power in us. There is more capacity. There is more ability for us to receive of the Lord and that what we have received of the Lord we pass on to others in Jesus name hallelujah 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 I'd say I'm glad that I have not made a total mess of myself here but um, God is good and uh, we give him praise uh, let me just finish um, with one passage in the from the gospel of John gospel of John um, chapter 15 and read with me if you have the time I'm not going to read it now but uh, read it at home it speaks of God of Jesus Christ being being that vine and he says for all of us who love the Lord for all of us who know the truth and commit and remain in that vine 
walk with the Lord in whatever difficulty, as long as we commit ourselves to Him, God continue to prune us. God continue to refine us through all our troubles, through all our difficulties, and we will continually give fruit for the name of the Lord. So it is my um, call, if you like, and encouragement to all of us talking to me myself. Let us commit to the Lord. Let us recommit to the Lord, especially at this time of lockdown. And let me tell you, friends, the more God works in us, it's not easy. It, it is painful, especially if we are going through addictions, especially if we are going through some horrible habits that may have become part of our life. That is going to be painful to get that rice out of our life. But the more of that rice that is taken, the freer we are, friends. And when we have overcome something, we have the keys to that victory. And we can move on with our life. There is nothing more powerful than the Spirit of the Lord. Scripture says that he who dwells in us is greater than he that is in the world. Amen? So give a chance to Jesus. Give your life to him. And allow him to strengthen you to face whatever difficulty you may be facing. Remember that you are worthy in the eyes of the Lord. You are precious. And God loves you with that tremendous and unconditional love. And He awaits for us to commit ourselves to Him and walk with Him. Hallelujah. May the Lord bless you and um, have a wonderful week. And I look forward to seeing you next week again. Bye for now.